Я хочу представить вам Питера Джонсона и Саут Кемптона. Он расскажет вам о том, что есть нового в лечении лифома Ходжкина. Питер. So I'm going to summarize the data which was presented at the Lugano meeting on Hodgkin lymphoma. And the areas of progress which I'm going to discuss this morning are first, the updated results on the use of PET-CT in response-adapted therapy. Secondly, some new prognostic indicators, particularly some of the features of the baseline PET scans, which we can use to uh, predict outcomes. And secondly, some early data on cell-free circulating DNA in plasma. I will also talk about some of the new therapies in Hodgkin lymphoma, particularly some... А. И вот теперь, да, и некоторую информацию, касающуюся PD-1 ингибиторов, а также комбинационную терапию. И очень кратко я бы хотел рассказать о новой биологии, которая касается лимфом. Ну, вот сейчас поговорим о рандомизированных исследованиях, которые проводились. Вот слева здесь это британское исследование, которое касалось рандомизированной популяции больных, которые получали АБВД по поводу продвинутого заболевания. Ну и также группа европейская HD, группа, группа больных с лимфомой Ходжкина. И, и больные были рандомизированы на то, чтобы иметь, норм, получать нормальное лечение. А – это АБВД схема. Ну, что, теперь, что касается, проводилось также серийное исследование в определенные периоды с помощью ПЭТ. И сравнивалось АБВД с эскалированной схемой, схемой на, на базе БАКОП. Эти результаты, которые дало исследование, которое здесь проводилось, напечатано в журнале Journal Clinical Oncology. И применение ПЭТ, оно увеличило без, без событийную выживаемость, но не в очень большой степени. Почти все больные. Не, не умерли от этого это заболевания, но это группа. Возможно, стало возможно понять те проблемы, которые возникают на ранней, при диагностике на ранней стадии заболевания. Вы везде, здесь видите абстракт, касающийся прогностической ценности тотального метаболического объема. Это особый термин, который здесь применяется. Это то, то лечение, которое в том случае, если имеется негативный пэт то тогда одна тактика, а это проводится определение тотального метаболического объема, так называемого. И хотелось бы посмотреть также на общий гликоли в зоне поражения. И это, это производится с помощью так называемой фтордеоксиглюкозы, которая используется в качестве маркера вот в этой, в этой, в этой ПЭТ-диагностике. Вопрос в том, как, насколько распространено заболевание, беспрогрессионная выживаемость, то есть вот это конечные точки, по которым мы смотрели, при том, при том условии, что исследование проводится, начиная с этапа ранней стадии заболевания. И вот вы можете увидеть больные, которые имеются, у которых на, в инициальной стадии был большой объем опухоли, то у них худшие исходы, нежели те, у кого был маленький метаболический объем. И таким образом можно выделить группу, группу больных, которые, у которых лечение не пойдет в этом варианте. Если вы сравните метаболический объем с помощью PET-скан и используете его для стратификации, для классификации больных, по прогнозу вы увидите различия между благоприятными и неблагоприятными пациентами, прогнозами пациентов. 
И можете увидеть, что определение метаболического объема, оно дает лучшую дискриминацию, лучшее разрешение между благоприятными и неблагоприятными группами, нежели э, исследование по, по шкале ОРЦ. И таким образом мы можем использовать исходные характеристики П для того, чтобы классифицировать больных на прогностические группы. Что, да, после двух циклов АБВД здесь довольно сложная схема, которая касается применения различных применений схемы АБВД прежде всего и э, использование результатов э, тотального метаболического объема больше и меньше 147 это линия, линия отсечения. Даже если вы возьмете, возьмете промежуточные исследования по ПЭТ, то вы увидите различия, различия между, 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 больными, между результатами у больных с высоким и низким метаболическим объемом. Если вы теперь посмотрите на рандомизированные исследования, и э, там была ранняя стадия лимфомы, теперь развернутая лимфома, и вы посмотрите данные, касающиеся результатов ПЭТ и прогностического их значения, то здесь эти данные касаются прежде всего германского исследования. Эти результаты этого показано было. Здесь слева вы видите, что схему обследования, где используется первое, первое ПЭТ, после первого ПЭТ принимается решение, дальше дается больному. And these patients should not have had radiotherapy. Uh, we said in the protocol that patients who were PET negative should not need radiotherapy at the completion of chemotherapy. This is the German HD18 study, a much more intensive approach where everybody gets escalated BCOP at the beginning, they have a PET scan, those who are PET negative are randomly allocated between completing another six cycles of escalated BCOP or going down to a total of only four cycles. So eight cycles versus four cycles for the PET negative. And in the PET positive, they tested the question of whether adding rituximab to the BCOP would improve the results in this group. So firstly, we presented an update of the RATHL study uh, with longer follow-up, with five years median follow-up. And what we showed is that in the randomized group, the PET negative group who were randomized between ABVD and AVD, there is no difference at all in three-year progression-free, in five-year progression-free survival. So the non-inferiority endpoint of this study is met, and we are confident that in patients who have a negative PET scan after two cycles of ABVD, there is no advantage to continuing gliomycin. This can safely be stopped. And with longer follow-up, we have a progression-free survival of just over 80% in this group and an overall survival of 95% in the patients who were PET negative. Because the progression-free survival in the PET negative group was not as high as we had hoped for, we have analyzed which factors predict for a less good outcome in the patients who have become PET negative after 2-ABVD. And what we find is that patients with high stage disease or high international prognostic score have an inferior progression-free survival here. So you can see that patients with stage 4 disease have a progression-free survival just below 80%, even though they have a negative interim PET scan. Patients with bulk and, pe and the PET score between 1 to 3 does not seem to influence the likelihood of progression or survival, but you can see that patients with high-stage disease have about a 4% less good uh, survival despite having a negative interim PET scan. So we would like to try and find ways to predict who is going to fail, uh, see whether this is the most accurate way of doing this. We looked at progression-free and overall survival also by age in this group. This is the age distribution in the RATHL study, showing that uh, a significant proportion of patients are over, were over the age of 50. Uh, so 56% of patients were under the age of 35. And of course, it is this group where we would like to avoid giving BCOP because of the problems with fertility. And what we see, this is the progression-free survival broken down by age and the overall survival broken down by age. 
In the under 35s, we have a progression-free survival of 83% and an overall survival of 97%. So excellent results in the young population of patients who have avoided BCOP in 85% of cases because they became PET negative. We also looked at uh, bulky stage two disease in this trial because there were some questions about whether not giving radiotherapy to patients who had become PET negative would be a problem for those with early stage bulky disease. So we looked at the results of those. We found that the PET negative rate was just under 80%, so patients with very bulky disease in the mediastinum are slightly less likely to become PET negative. The rate for the trial as a whole was 85%. We looked at what happened to them. They were evenly split between ABVD and AVD, and 12% of patients got given consolidation radiotherapy off protocol, whereas in the PET positive group, just over a quarter of patients were given consolidation radiotherapy. If we look at the results of the treatment, this is not a randomized comparison. This is a small number of patients who had radiotherapy and a larger number of patients who didn't have radiotherapy. There is no sign of worse figures in the patients who did not have radiotherapy despite having bulky disease provided the PET scan was negative. And we could not see a difference according to whether they had bleomycin, according to whether you could see a residual mass on the CT scan or whether the PET score was one, two or three. So it looks as though not giving radiotherapy to patients who are PET negative is okay even if they have bulk disease. In the PET positive group, however, who went on to up to BCOP, we found that the small number of patients who had radiotherapy had a much better outlook. There were only 11 patients got radiotherapy, but only one of these relapsed, despite the fact that only five out of the 11 had a conventional CR on the PET scan. And the patients who didn't have radiotherapy with a positive interim PET appear to do less well. So we think that there is a role for giving radiotherapy to those who have an interim positive PET, but in an interim negative, we think it's safe to leave it out. I've lost my slides again. Here we go. The next abstract I, was one where we looked at a gene expression-based model to see whether we could use this to predict the outcomes in this group of patients. This is based upon a gene expression array analysis which was published some years ago now by the group in Canada who managed to separate Hodgkin's disease into low and high risk dependent on the pattern of gene expression. And this suggested that those with a favorable pattern of gene expression had a better prognosis than those with a high risk pattern. So we carried out the same analysis on the Rathal study patients. And I'm afraid the conclusion is that this model does not work. This is the progression free survival looking at high risk and low risk using the same gene expression profile. And there is a small separation, not significant in overall survival. But if we look at the causes of death, which causes this separation, it isn't the Hodgkin's disease. In fact, it's other causes of death which are contributing most to the high risk group having a slightly lower overall survival. And Hodgkin's disease is very small numbers of deaths in each group. So we can conclude from this that the gene expression profile at the baseline, which was previously reported, is no use for making a prediction. And also the American group published similar data at the same meeting. However, another molecular test which may be more, more useful is the use of liquid biopsies, so circulating free DNA. And this was data presented by the Italian group led by David Rossi, who looked at circulating DNA in the plasma of patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma. So he looked at uh, the, co the comparison of blood and microdissected tissue from a paraffin fixed biopsy and carried out CAPSEQ, which has been reported a couple of years ago, to look at the ab abnormalities, the mutations which are present in the DNA, both of the dissected uh, biopsy material and also in the blood. And he also compared this in a small number of patients to what happened after treatment as they were followed through um, their therapy. So what they found firstly is liquid biopsy, what is present in the blood, is a very close mirror of the, ge of the genomic changes which you see in the biopsy material. So I draw your attention to this diagram here which shows 
the mutation which was present in both the biopsy DNA and the plasma DNA was 57, uh, in 57 cases was the same, with only nine mutations identified in the plasma but not in the blood. So a very high level of concordance, a very high similarity between plasma DNA and the biopsy material. So, and this is a distribution of all, the, of all the mutations which were found in this, and you can see all the usual mutated genes which you have in Hodgkin lymphoma. And very interestingly, in this small series where they looked sequentially at the changes in the amount of, of, of plasma DNA, the copy numbers that you see in the plasma, this is a waterfall plot showing the greatest reduction of, of plasma DNA from the Hodgkin's disease in this group and the least in this group. And you can see that there is some correlation with the interim PET score. This is the Deauville score, the five-point scale of the PET. But you can see that right down here is a patient who has a positive PET scan, but has a big reduction in circulating tumor DNA. And similarly here, here are patients with positive PET scans with quite good reductions in circulating free DNA. And if you look at the outcomes of this and what happens to them, you can see that even though they have a positive PET scan, they have no relapse if they have clearance of the circulating free DNA. So this may be a test which adds information to an interim PET scan. It is relatively complex to do to measure the level of the mutations present in the plasma DNA, but it looks as though this may help us to guide therapy so that patients who become PET negative but still have circulating DNA may need more treatment, and conversely, patients who remain po positive but have cleared their DNA may be able to de-escalate therapy. There was also uh, some work on the baseline PET features in the RATHL trial presented by our group, and they looked at different methods of measuring the amount of lymphoma present at the baseline. So this is very similar to the study that was done in the early stage, and they used different measures. They used the SUV uh, of more than 2.5, and that measures an area like this on a scan. They measured 140% uh, of the maximum SUV in the normal liver, and this gives you a very similar area. Or you can also measure the, the area that has an SUV of more than 41% of the highest SUV, which gives you a rather more small area, more difficult to define. And they used the first 100 patients to determine the best way of analyzing this for the, for the UK patients in the RATHL study. And what we found was that the metabolic tumor volume either the total or, the, or that of the bulkiest lesion was very predictive for Hodgkin's disease events, so recurrences, um, and also for progression-free survival. And so was total lesional glycolysis, again, for either the total or the bulkiest lesion, and you can see the p-values here are very significant. So either the metabolic tumor volume or the total lesional glycolysis was associated with a very significant difference in three-year Hodgkin events and progression-free survival. And when we modeled this in the group of patients, in 600-odd uh, patients in the study, we could see that those who had a low uh, total lesional glycolysis at the baseline had a very different prognosis to those where it was high, with, you can see, a 30% progression rate in those with high-risk disease. And even among the PET-negative patients, the interim PET-negative patients, a third, nearly a third of patients progress if they have high baseline uh, TLG. And so this allows us to start again to add information to the interim PET scan. And these are curves shown according to both the baseline total lesional glycolysis, either low or high, and the interim PET. And what you see is that if you have a negative interim PET and a low volume disease at baseline, the prognosis is very good. But if you have a negative interim PET but a high TLG, the outcomes are as bad as if you have a positive interim PET. So again, this may allow us to select the patients at the diagnosis who need more intensive initial treatment because we know that even a negative interim PET scan does not guarantee a good outcome for them. Finally, some data from the German Hodgkin study group, and again, this data has recently been published in Lancet Oncology, but this was an update on their information, and to remind you of the trial design, patients had two cycles of escalated BCOP before a PET scan. The ones that were positive went on to continue BCOP or to have rituximab added for the last five cycles, and those who were negative had a reduced dose of BCOP in half the cases. 
And what they presented was the updated results of the progression-free survival according to whether or not patients received rituximab. And what you can see here is that there is no difference at all. So adding rituximab for patients who have interim pet positive disease makes no difference to the outcome, and they've stopped doing this. So patients do not need to have rituximab. When they compared the progression-free survivals to, the, to those that they saw in their previous HD15 trial that used eight cycles of BCOP, they were very good and, if, if anything, slightly better as a result of the new approach. They since amended their protocol so that patients go on to have two cycles of BCOP. If it's positive, they just complete six cycles in all of BCOP because the HD15 trial showed that the results of six cycles were better than eight cycles for some reason. And the negative, pet negative arm is still being randomized. And what they showed here is that there is a difference in the patients who have six cycles since the change of the protocol between those who have a Deauville score of three who in this group were called PET positive, and this may be one reason why the PET positive results in this study are very good. We called these PET negative in Rathal, but they called them positive. And you can see the difference opens up if they have six cycles of treatment, where there's, there seemed to be less difference previously when they had eight. So to summarize the results of response-adapted therapy using FTG-PET, we think this provides an opportunity to personalize the approach to treatment for patients with Hodgkin's disease, both early and late stage disease, and allows us to get the best balance between the effectiveness of the treatment and its toxicity. The accuracy of the interim PET is influenced by two important features. One is how extensive the disease is at the baseline, how much disease there is, and we can measure this using PET features. And secondly, how intensive the treatment is. So the more intensive the treatment, the more accurate is a negative interim PET scan. We can de-escalate the therapy, and that retains the efficacy of treatment and probably reduces morbidity in the long term. And the escalation of treatment, certainly going from ABVD to BCOP, improves disease control, but not adding rituximab. And we think this is a good way to test new types of treatment for Hodgkin's lymphoma. So moving on to the new types of treatment, there was some data presented about the use of brintuximab vedotin in different contexts. This was a phase two trial in patients who were not suitable for chemotherapy because they were too old or too frail or had other illnesses. And this was from the UK group. So these patients were screened. They had four cycles of brintuximab vedotin single agent and then had a PET scan. If they had a complete metabolic response or they were responding, they would have another four cycles of brintuximab. Similarly, if they were stable at that point, they would have another four, so four, two, six, eight, 12. Total of 16 cycles of brintuximab potentially allowed, but those who progressed at any stage came off, off therapy. So this were the characteristics of this group. You can see that for Hodgkin's disease, it's a very elderly population, an average age of 77. The frailty score was quite high. Um, the disease stage was quite high. Half of them had stage four disease, uh, and, the, and half of them had a performance status of two or three. And you can see the, the Huss and Claver scores here, and uh, uh, most of them had extranodal disease. A number of dose reductions were required, mainly for peripheral neuropathy. So this is an important point from this study, which is that giving brentuximab vedotin to elderly and frail patients will result in high figures for peripheral neuropathy. And these were dose reductions required in two thirds of patients. And there was others, also some other toxicity. So the complete metabolic response rate after four cycles was only a quarter of patients. The overall response rate was 84%, but as you can see, the progression-free survival to single-agent brentuximab vedotin is not very satisfactory, with a median progression-free survival of only about eight months. So this is a tolerable therapy, but there is a high incidence of toxicity, particularly dose reductions for neuropathy, and although there's a high overall response rate, the complete metabolic responses are low, and the progression-free su survival is unsatisfactory. So this would not be recommended as treatment for advanced Hodgkin lymphoma. Another study from the UK looked at the effectiveness of brentuximab vedotin in patients with relapsed and refractory Hodgkin's disease as a way of getting to transplant if possible. So patients with recurrent disease in whom we wish to go on to high dose therapy. This was a retrospective study of just under 100 patients 
uh, who were given brentuximab vodotin after conventional chemotherapy, either second line or, or after several salvage treatments. The overall response rate was just over 50% in these patients with a complete response rate measured by a CT scan of just under a third. Uh, the response rate is shown here according to which line of treatment it was, third, fourth, or fifth line, and you can see there's not much difference, but the numbers are increasingly small in these groups, so you've only got five patients who had fifth line treatment. If we look at what happened to the patients after the brentuximab vodotin, a significant proportion didn't go on to the intended high-dose therapy. They only had conventional therapy or no further treatment. And then about a third had uh, autologous stem cell transplant, either straight after the brentuximab or after some further treatment. And about another third went on to allotransplant, transplant, again, either straight away or after some further treatment. And if we look at the results, the progression-free survival overall is, is a bit disappointing. Uh, it, there's a very sharp decline in this curve. This is a difficult group of patients, but there are some durable remissions, particularly in those who achieve a complete response. Um, and this is the overall survival. So the median progression-free survival was, was only 5.6 months, but the overall survival was not too bad at three years. And these are the results of the subsequent treatment. Now, of course, this is not randomized. And the, the patients who did best on brentuximab vodotin went on to have an autograft. The allograft population looks as though just under 50% of them have, uh, can expect long-term progression-free survival. But for the patients who couldn't get to high dose, the results were very poor. So once again, single-agent brentuximab vodotin on its own is really only a means to get to more effective treatment, to some consolidation treatment. It's not sufficiently potent to achieve long-term results in the great majority of these patients with relapsed and refractory disease. Moving on now to nivolumab, there is a lot of data now about using anti-PD-1 antibodies for relapsed and refractory Hodgkin lymphoma. And this was the final analysis of the phase two study reported from the, uh, an international group who had looked at this for patients with relapsed and refractory disease. So this is the waterfall plot showing the degree of response to single agent nivolumab in patients in three different cohorts those who had never been exposed to brentuximab vodotin, those who had had it but after autologous transplant, and people who'd had brentuximab both before and after an autologous transplant. And you can see from the colors in this plot that there's a very high response rate in all three of these groups. So regardless of whether they've been previously exposed to brentuximab vodotin, and regardless of whether or not they've had... Very high okay. Very okay. Очень высокие, очень высокая пропорция ответа на него лумап у этих больных. И здесь, то есть здесь уже порядка до 70% частота ответа. Так что вы можете увидеть, что хорошая частота ответа при группе с него лумапом. И вот вы видите без прогрессионной выживаемости вот в этой когорте. У них больных были, была проведена высокодозная терапия, им использовался и брентуксимаб, и трансплантация, и там достаточно хорошее беспрогрессионное выживание в течение года. И вот ну, это полный ответ на него лумаб, который достаточно высок, частота вот этих вот полных ответов на него лумаб в данном случае. Так, ну, ответ на, на антипедиван антитела после логенной трансплантации, поскольку аллоген трансплантации является иммуностимулирующей иммуно иммунотерапией, ну, здесь вы можете видеть, что имеется ответ, зависящий от наличия реакции трансплантата против хозяина, коль скоро это недосильные иммунные нарушения. Это совпадает с тем, что мы наблюдали у больных и раньше в этой ситуации, что вот до... Нет, нет данных о том, что лечение неволумабом, которое является, что оно дает повышенный риск ГВХД, РТПХ, простите, после трансплантации. Здесь указаны соответствующие проценты. Это более-менее то, что в этой группе ожидалось. Так что у меня есть два активных новых лечения, которые касаются применения неволумаба, бринвид бриндуксимаба. И возможно, что и они окажутся эффективными способами терапии для данного заболевания в будущем. Данная американская группа, которая здесь, которая применяли неволумаб, 
Это вот построение этой работы. Не воспользовался в первом цикле и в последующем тут указано где. Пациенты получали стандартную дозу терапии, стандартную терапию, потом не волумаб. Если обладать не на побочные эффекты, вопрос возник, не будет ли здесь существенных побочных эффектов, связанных с нарушением иммунной системы. Вот здесь имеются... Здесь есть несколько, здесь, здесь очень небольшой процент таких крупных побочных реакций. Не, 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 не объяснимый, простите, неизвестная ранее так, необъяснимая токсичность неволумаба. Ну, она может быть привести, неволумаб может привести к тяжелым побочным эффектам, например, к сепсису. И можете увидеть, что вы, но если вы применяете, допустим, системные стероиды, то это может вызвать примерно те же результаты. Что касается комбинации, неволумаба опять хороший ответ. На, от, на ответ в комбинированной терапии ответ очень хороший на него ломап и это показывает и по результатам э, ПЭТ, естественно, где показывает хороший ответ по метаболизму опухоли. Так что посмотрим и имеем, что нам кажется, что у нас кажется есть у нас хорошее комбинационное лечение. Вот еще один абстракт, это больной из, ой, простите, абстракт из клиники Шарите, где рассматривается опять новый подход к лечению болезни Хошкина. Вот это речь идет о о бэклеточно направленной терапии, как он пишет. Это, то есть здесь будут быть использованы соответствующие ингибиторы определенных хиназ, которые будут подавлять эти бэклетки. И речь идет главным образом о о том, чтобы эти клетки простимулировать через промотор выработку CD19. И таким образом, и таким образом эти клетки станут более уязвимыми, более похожими на Б-клетки. И тогда можно будет их легче, легче лечить, легче поражать. Значит, если вы объедините тогда лечением обычной АТР и другими препаратами, вы увидите, что экспрессия в этих клетках она значительно увеличивается. Но если вы дадите препарат, вот этих вот двух препаратов, которые здесь указаны, то у вас усилится, усилите экспрессию этих Б-клеточных фенотипов этих клеток и сделайте их более пригодными для терапии. На поверхности этих клеток может проявляться также CD20. Можно использовать соответствующие соединения, так называемые Compound 40. И тогда это лучше подается ретуксимабу. Вот некоторые данные касаются и брутиниба, полученные на клеточных линиях от больных очков на лимфомы. И вы видите, что по отношению к так называемому веществу 40 клетки становятся очень чувствительны в этих инвитроэкспериментах. И в будущем, наверное, мы сможем найти те факторы, которые усилят эти факторы, которые позволят лечить э, лимфому Ходжкина. Эти факторы должны усиливать транскрипцию соответствующих антигенов, транскрипцию и трансляцию соответствующих антигенов. Наконец, в плане, в плане нового лечения, из, лечения результатов следующий же блитоксимафедатин является хорошим моно моноагентом но недостаточно для того чтобы вылечить разве развитую развернутую развернутую болезнь хочкин и не волома дал хороший был и частый достаточно ответ на на лечение болезни хочкина лечение у больных но независимо от глубины ответа Бентоксимафедоксин, оно позволяет преодолевать рефрактерность предыдущей терапии. Комбинация бентоксимаба с неволомабом, оно, кажется, дает, что дает очень высокий объективный респонс. Скорее, нежели полный, полный ответ. Ну и, наконец... Ну, конец восстановления бэкклеточной программы дифференцировки также может быть интересных терапий в будущем. Большое спасибо, да, дайте я закончу. И большое спасибо за внимание. Большое спасибо, Питер.
на какие-то срочные вопросы. Так, пожалуйста, микрофон. Касается... Ему надо надеть. Да, но я могу сказать по-английски. Подождите. Хорошо. Может перевести. Мой вопрос касается использования радиотерапии у больных с пэт негативным статусом после ХТ и вот при при балке при балке заболевания при массивном заболевании. Так что вопрос, вопрос касается радиотерапии у больных, которые имеют балки дизиз, но пэт негативные. То есть данный ХРПЛ, данные, что это не обязательно. Так что это, это, я думаю, что использование радиотерапии в развернутом заболевании при поднегативном статусе. При заболевании в ранней фазе, ну, это более деликатный вопрос. То есть молодые женщины с, при медиастинальном расположении, ну вот это вопрос... 90% имеет 90% более на, на долгосрочное выживание. Если это уже человек мужчина в 50 лет, 50 лет и больше, то у него тогда радиотерапию наверное, можно провести. То есть есть небольшое преимущество в прогрессии, но не, не в выживаемости. Так что для большинства больных, где больная, где, где больных, где можно ожидать позднюю токсичность, в частности, сердечную или легочную токсичность, в частности, развитие опухоли, то радиотерапия следует избегать даже если болезни массивные заображение массивное